Well, hello once again, and welcome to the next small group series here with the Church at Eastern Oaks. Today we begin a brand new series titled, Fruit of the Spirit, Growing in Godliness. Fruit of the Spirit, Growing in Godliness. As we begin, I want to introduce you to a book. Uh, this is the, the primary text that we're going to be using and talking about in this class. The name of this book is Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit, Growing in Godliness by Christopher J.H. Wright. It's a great book about the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to quote it a lot. I'm going to refer to it a lot. So again, if you want to do some extra study, if you're looking for some something extra to read, this is a great book. I highly recommend it. Get this book. You can read along with us one chapter a week as we do this study together. So, Cultivating the Fruit of the Spirit by Christopher J.H. Wright. You can get it on Amazon. There's actually a link on our webpage uh, where you can go straight to it and get it. So, it's a good book. As we get started with this study today, the first thing I want to ask you is this. Have you ever had any experience with a vegetable garden? All right, or, or, or maybe a fruit tree of some kind? Uh, for the past several years, Hannah and I have, my wife Hannah and I have uh, experimented with a small vegetable garden at our home with varying degrees of success. Okay, sometimes things work out, more times than not they don't. Uh, but we've grown over the past couple of years tomatoes and cucumbers and squash. Uh, we currently have a couple blueberry bushes. Um, and again, sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. However, there has been one constant. Through all of our experimenting in our vegetable garden, there has been one constant. Our tomato plants, if remain healthy, if they remain healthy, produce tomatoes every time. Cucumber plants gave us cucumbers. You'll never guess what our blueberry bushes produced. Blueberries, that's right. Every single time. You see, whatever type of plant we planted, the fruit always corresponded with what we planted. Not one time did our tomato plants give us anything other than tomatoes. And listen, it would have been ridiculous of me to expect otherwise, right? It would be ridiculous of me to go out to my tomato plants and wonder, where are all the oranges? That's ridiculous. Why is this the case? And more importantly, what's my point this morning? My point is that being precedes doing. Being precedes doing. Trees produce based on what they are. So an apple tree produces apples not because it wants to or even because it tries to, but because that is its nature. That's what it does. Jesus says this best. I'm going to read this off my computer screen here, but if you have your Bibles, you're going to turn to Luke chapter 6. Jesus says this best in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 45, or 43 through 45. Jesus says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from a bramble bush. For the good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Again, today we're beginning this brand new study. This brand, brand new small group series titled, Fruit of the Spirit, Growing in Godliness. You see, Jesus tells us that each tree is known by its fruit. And in his analogy here, the tree is us. The tree is people. Our people. Is people? I don't know. You get what I'm saying. As believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we should be recognizable by our fruits. Just as the unsaved or the lost are recognized by their fruits, we should be recognized by our fruits, our actions, the way we live our life should be a result of what is in our heart. Our friends, our family members, our co-workers, even casual acquaintances, should be able to look at me as a Christian and immediately know something's different. They should see the fruit in my life. If you're a believer, they should see the fruit in your life and they should immediately know that you're different, that you're a Christ follower. But what fruit is it that identifies us as such. So what fruit, what actions, what characteristics identify us as Christians? What fruit should be evident in our life? 
Well, the answer to that question is the subject of this study. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit lives inside each and every one of us. And that's going to be evident by the fruit that we produce. And the Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit, the results of the Holy Spirit living in us, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those nine characteristics comprise the fruit of the Spirit. That's what our life will look like if the Holy Spirit is living in us. These nine characteristics, now get this because this is important, these nine characteristics are not merely things we try to do, but they are the result of who we are. Remember what Jesus said, a, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. If we're Christians, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, if we're living in a right relationship with God, we don't necessarily have to go out every day and try to be loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, gentle, and so on. We will just naturally be those things. Now, not perfectly, no, because we're still growing and maturing. Our fruit's not fully ripe yet. But as we grow, that fruit is going to become ripe and it's going to become more evident. It's going to be a natural byproduct of who we are. We find these nine characteristics. We find the fruit of the Spirit listed for us in Galatians chapter 5. Again, if you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and turn to Galatians. Please do so. However, before we look at these nine characteristics, which we're going to do one a week for the next nine weeks after this week, today I just want to look a little bit about the context the context of Galatians. So we find the fruit of the Spirit in the book of Galatians. Galatians is one of Paul's 13 epistles. Epistle is just another word for a letter. Paul wrote letters to churches. He wrote letters to individuals. Uh, and we have 13 of those letters in the New Testament. Galatians is one of those letters. Uh, we, we find this out in Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. If you want to turn there. We read in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So this is a letter that Paul is writing to the churches of Galatia. One of the things that makes the book of Galatians a little unique is that it is one of the only letters that Paul addresses to a group of, of people. Okay? So many of the the uh, epistles that we look at um, are actually to an individual or maybe to one church. This is to a whole region of churches. And we see that in verse 2. It says to the churches of Galatia. So that's an interesting point about Galatians. Um, before we again, before we get to the fruit of the Spirit, let's take a little bit of time to understand what's going on in Galatia, in the region of that Paul is writing to. What circumstances prompted Paul to write this letter? So as you know, Paul was called, and we just read this in verse 1, Paul was called to be a missionary by God, be an apostle. He was called by the Lord to be an apostle. And he was a missionary specifically to the Gentiles. Gentiles just means non-Jews. Gentile is the Hebrew word goyim. It means nation. It means people. So the Jews basically looked at things as they were the Jewish people, and it was everybody else. The Gentiles, that just means everybody else. Well, Paul was specifically called to be a, an, uh, uh, excuse me, a missionary to the Gentiles. So he, along with Barnabas, are traveling through this region, and they're preaching the gospel, and they're planting churches, and they're seeing people get saved. That's great. Well, however, there comes a time where Paul leaves Galatia, right? He's, he's going from town to town, city to city, region to region. He's preaching the gospel. He's starting churches. So he leaves Galatia. People have gotten saved. Churches have started. He's moving on. After his departure, a group of missionaries, another group of missionaries come in. And they're also Jews like Paul. They're Jew, uh, Jewish Christians, Jews who have converted to Christianity. They come in to the region of Galatia. However, they had a little bit different belief system than Paul did. You see, this group of missionaries believed incorrectly, wrongly, falsely. They believed and they taught the Gentiles that in order to be saved, you had to both accept Jesus and keep all the Old Testament law. You see, Paul said, that's not, that's not the, the way things work. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you don't have to keep all of the Old Testament law. All right? 
these missionaries came in and said, oh, no, that's not right. You have to keep the Old Testament law. All right? And so they're, they're teaching kind of a false gospel. So now what does Paul do? Paul hears about this, and he writes the letter of Galatians back to the churches in Galatia to straighten this out. Paul wants them to understand, listen, salvation is by faith alone. You do not have to keep the Old Testament law to earn your salvation. That's not the way it works. Salvation is by faith alone. And he wants them to know this. For instance, he writes in Galatians chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. Here's what he says starting in verse 25. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and God through faith. The guardian in verse 25 is referring to the Old Testament law. And Paul says, you're not under the guardian. You're not under the law anymore. Right? However, he also wants you to know that faith in Christ is not an excuse or a license to sin. Just because you're saved by faith doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to do. He goes on and says this in chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Paul says, For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. A scholar Christopher J.H. Wright, who wrote, wrote that book that I showed you earlier, he comments that legalism at one extreme, which is keeping all the rules, and license at the other extreme, which is rejecting all the rules, are completely wrong answers to the question, how should Christians live? Both are wrong answers to the question, how should Christians live? So, if legalism, keeping all the rules, is wrong, and license, rejecting all the rules, is wrong, how should Christians live? What is our standard for morality? What is our standard for right and wrong? How do we know what to do? Well, Paul addresses this in Ephesians chapter 5. We keep reading, we come to, excuse me, Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. That's our guiding principle for life. Not obey all the laws, not reject all the laws. Our guiding principle for life is to walk, to live by the Spirit. Again, right comments. At last, Paul comes to his big point. If we should not be governed by either the law or the flesh, then what should govern how we live? Answer, the Spirit. That is the heart and soul of Christian living. It is the center and secret of what it means to be a person in Christ. We are to walk by the Spirit. In fact, this is so important. Paul repeats this truth using four different Greek verbs. In Galatians 5, 16, he says, walk by the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 18, he says, we're to be led by the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 25, he says, we're supposed to live by the Spirit. And then later, he says, we're supposed to walk, which is a, he uses a different Greek verb that time, which means to keep in step with the Spirit. Right. Scholar Timothy George writes, each of these verbs suggests a relationship of dynamic, a dynamic interaction, direction, and purpose. In Paul's vocabulary, to walk in the Spirit or to be led by the Spirit means to go where the Spirit is going, to listen to His voice, to discern His will, to follow His guidance. You see, that's what it means to live life as a Christian. No, we don't have to obey all of the Old Testament laws. But no, we don't get to ignore all the laws and reject laws and reject rules. What does it mean? It means we walk by the Spirit. That's what it means to live as a Christian. We obey the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit in conjunction with God's Word, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, that we learn to live. Right? It is the Holy Spirit, through the Word, through God's Word, that directs and guides us. Right? And this, of course, is exactly what Jesus told us was going to happen. Back in the book of John, Jesus says in John 16, verses 12 through 14, John 16, 12 through 14, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and will declare to you the things that are to come. How, uh, he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you. So now the million dollar question. What will it practically look like if we walk by the Spirit? So we've said that the way we are supposed to live our life is to walk by the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. What will that practically look like? It's one thing to know I'm supposed to walk by the Spirit, but it's another thing, all to under, another thing altogether to understand what does that practically mean? What does it look like? However, before Paul goes into that, before Paul tells us what it will mean, he tells us what it will not mean. 
before Paul gives us the fruit of the Spirit, he actually tells us the opposite, what he calls the works of the flesh. This is again in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Here's what we read, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does Paul mean by works of the flesh? He calls these the works of the flesh. What does that mean? Paul uses the term flesh in contrast to the Spirit. So the things of the Spirit are the things of God. They're the things that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. While the things of the flesh are the sinful things, the worldly things. Uh, again, J.H. Wright comments, In Paul's writing, the flesh does not simply mean our physical human bodies, but rather it is shorthand for our fallen sinful human nature, which includes our bodies, of course, but also embraces our thoughts, emotions, wills, desires, feelings. So when Paul talks about the works of the flesh, he's talking about our sinful nature. All right. The items in the list he's just mentioned, those are traits that characterize the lost because their sinful nature is just full-blown. Okay, they're, they're not trying to restrain it. The Holy Spirit's not living in them. So that's what characterizes an unbeliever. These verses clearly describe the world in which we live. You can look at that list again, the works of the flesh, and you see that's where we live today. However, it's important to understand that these are character traits of the lost. In other words, these are the type of behaviors that characterize a lost person. That doesn't mean that anyone that ever commits one of these things is lost. Okay, we're not perfect yet. We're going to sin. Sometimes we're going to make mistakes. We may even do one of the things on that list. Okay, just because you commit a sinful act doesn't mean you're lost. What Paul is saying is those types of things characterize the life of the lost. So if that is the way you purposely live your life, you're not trying to stop it, you're not trying to change, that's just the way you live your life, those characteristics, the works of the flesh, then that's your fruit. And your fruit demonstrates that you are lost. You are a bad tree, to use Jesus' words, and therefore you have bad fruit. Okay, If we're Christians, if the Holy Spirit is living in us, we're not going to be perfect, but we're going to strive against those things. We will fight to eradicate those things. We're going to start to see changes in our life as the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? So it doesn't mean we'll never do those things, but it means those things will not characterize our life. And it's important to notice what the Scripture says is the result of someone whose life is characterized by the works of the flesh. Verse 21b says that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We saw earlier, Jesus told us the exact same thing. Jesus said, each tree is known by its fruits. Right? If our lives are characterized by the works of the flesh, that's evidence that the Holy Spirit is not in us because we are not Christians. doesn't mean we won't struggle with sin. I think we will. But it does mean that we are, if we are followers of Christ, excuse me, if we are followers of Christ, we will battle against sin. All right. All right, so what about the fruit of the Spirit? We've talked about what it does not look like to walk by the Spirit. So what does it look like to walk by the Spirit? And that's what Paul finally comes to, and that's the point of this study, or the focus of this study. Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22 through verse 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. All right. Just as the works of the flesh characterize the life of an unbeliever, the fruit of the Spirit characterize the life of a believer, of a Christian. If the previous list describes the world in which we live, you should easily be able to see how the fruit of the Spirit stand out. How if we're living by the fruit of the Spirit, if we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, if we have all of those things, and the world does not have those things, wow, we're going to stand out. We're going to look different. And that's the whole point. We're supposed to look different. If you notice the first part of verse 22, I want to point this out. In Galatians 5.22, do you notice... 
that these are described as the fruit of the Spirit? That's actually important. Fruit is singular. These are not the fruits of the Spirit. They are the fruit of the Spirit. What's the difference? Why does that distinction matter? This is not a list of nine different things that we go and try to do. This is not even a list of nine characteristics we try to exemplify. Okay? What are they? These nine traits are to be, under, are to be understood as one. All nine characteristics are the fruit singular of the Spirit. In other words, if we are walking by the Spirit, all of these things will be evident in our life. Sometimes as Christians, we can be guilty of saying, well, I'm not very patient, but I'm really kind. So that's okay, right? I don't have this one, but I have this one. That's not how it works. We do not get to choose which fruit of the Spirit we want to exemplify. If we are walking by the Spirit, He is going to be changing us so that all nine characteristics will be evident in our life. He is going to be working on all of them in our life. Again, Wright says this, All the lovely words he writes are taken all together as the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. Now, fruit is the natural product of life. If a tree is alive, it will bear fruit. That is the nature of being a living tree. Fruit is what you get when a tree has life in it. But look at the qualities in Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit. They do not focus on what kind of performance we can achieve, but what kind of person we are. Okay. This goes back to what we said at the very beginning. An apple tree produces apples because that is what it does by its very nature. As we conclude and wrap up today's lesson, this is what I want us to remember. This study that we are beginning today is not about a list of things to do. That's not what this study is. This is not about behavior modification. Okay, That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is not behavior modification. Christianity is living in a relationship with Christ. And when I live with Christ, He's going to begin to change me. Not what I do, but who I am. And when He changes who I am, it will change what I do. Okay, listen. I cannot do what Jesus wants me to do until I become who Jesus wants me to become. And I do that through the Holy Spirit working in me. I do that through following the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, studying the Word of God, spending time in prayer with God. The closer I draw to God, the more I become like God. And when I become like God, you're going to see the evidence in my life. And that evidence is going to be peace, joy, love, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. I think I missed a couple, but there's nine of them. As we examine the fruit of the Spirit over the next several weeks, our focus is going to be on being, not doing. Okay? We don't, next week, we're going to talk about love. We don't want to talk about, let's go out and do a loving act. Okay? We want to talk about becoming loving people, looking at the love of God, embracing the love of God, letting Him change us to become loving people. Why? Because loving people will do loving things. This study is about being, not doing. This study is about being who the Lord wants me to be. And that happens in a relationship with Him when I'm walking by the Spirit. And when I am who He wants me to be, I'll do what He wants me to do. Next week, we're talking about love. I want you to read some passages before then. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 14. I want you to look at those again, as well as Galatians 5, 22 through 26. I want you to look at 1 John 3 through 4. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and John 13, 13 through 34. As you're reading those passages, here's some questions I want you to ask. I want you to ask yourself, what is love? How would you define it? How would you explain it? Is love an emotion? Is it an attitude? Is it an action? Is it all of the above? Are there different types of love? And if so, what types of love are there? Why do you think Paul begins the list of the fruit of the Spirit with love? Why is it first? Why is it number one? Is that significant? And lastly, what do we accomplish when we love one another? Right. So there's some scriptures to read this week and questions to ponder until we come back and meet again. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for his life, his death, and his resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is living inside of us, changing us every single day. Lord, I pray that you give us the strength and the wisdom to walk by the Spirit, to follow the Spirit, to listen to the Spirit, and to become who you want us to become. I ask you to watch over us and protect us as we come back next time. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.